But um, so the first lesson I, th I think that I want to share is that, you know, we have the ability to be so much more than we are. And one of the things that we can do is by learning more languages. And we live in a world, unfortunately, where the backlash has been English only. But you know what? There's a joke that I used to hear all the time in Europe, and they'd say, you know, what do you call a person who is, speaks three languages? Uh, they're trilingual. What do, you, what do you call a person who speaks two languages? They're bilingual. What do you call a person who speaks only one language? American. <laughs> you know, everyone in Europe speaks more than one language. They speak, you know, they all learn either English or in Belgium they learn Flemish and, you know, and, and Dutch. And, you know, there's all just sorts of, everyone speaks more than one language. In Japan they learn other languages. Uh, it's just, and it's so easy for young kids to do it. My children, they can pick up Korean so much easier than I ever could. It's effortless for them. And yet, when do we offer language? In the eighth grade? And we give them two choices? You know, what is going on with that? You know, why are we not taking advantage of the fact, and we live in such global communities, why are we not uh, enabling our children to learn more languages? It only can help them in a global world where, you know, we, we know that we're not the only ones here on this planet, and we know that English isn't the only thing spoken, even though we, you know, it is a dominant language. Uh, it is a gateway, language is a gateway to other worlds. And if you have that, I mean, I've been blessed to, to speak Spanish, and I, uh, have loved traveling through Latin America because I just don't like visit the you know the the buildings and the museums. I talk to people and I talk about them and understand their lives and see their world perspective, and it's much more uh, um, fruitful experience than if you're just simply visiting the sites. So it, it is something. It's a wonderful opportunity we're losing on. So that I think is really a critical issue. And I hear it here in LA when we work with communities, they will tell us, you know what. Um, I'm having trouble with my neighbor because they've got a rooster that wakes me up every morning. But you know what? I don't even know how to talk to them because they don't even speak English. You know? But yet, the line for the, the waiting list for classes to teach English are huge. We don't make it easy for, you know, for that to happen. And we certainly don't make it easy in our public schools. And so part of the thing that's going to bridge the gap is language. And that's a barrier or it can be a great advantage. So that's one lesson I think that we see as being critical for the success of, of our society. Um, and certainly in that case, we're behind other communities, um, but it's something that we certainly can catch up. And I think the saddest thing is I think that there are children who can't even speak to their grandparents in the same language. I mean, they don't have a common language. You know, and that was the case with me. I grew up, and, and my grandparents, the ones that were alive still when I was growing up, they spoke very little English, and I spoke very little Japanese because you know, say maybe it's part of the internment experience, but my parents did not feel it was important to teach me Japanese. You know, they, they were living here in the United States. They grew up in a world where it was English speaking. And they, um, you know, I, of course, chastised them for it later. But, you know, in their world, they're thinking, you know, we want them to succeed in the United States. And speaking Japanese hadn't helped my parents. You know, they ended up in camps. And, you know, we are constantly, you know, a, a targeted minority. Why should, that, why should we want to emphasize the difference? But the truth is that um, you know, when you talk about English plus, you know, then you're talking about something that's an added value. And it's something that you, you know, no one loses English fluency by learning another language. The other thing that um, is very clear is that another, another lesson that I think we should all take home is that you know, race is clearly a social invention, a social construction. We decide what race is by what we decide in this country. I went to South Africa and they told me that there were 17 different racial categories there. And it was based on the way you looked. And you know, some of the brothers and sisters would be living in different communities because if you were light-skinned, you would be colored and you could, had to live here. If you were dark-skinned, you were black and you had to live in the township. And you couldn't live in the same place. And it was that arbitrary and silly but that's the way they defined it, and that's the apartheid regime. It was divide and conquer, and that was a great way that, that they remained in power for many years. But the truth is that we create those divisions. Now, does that mean we can just make them disappear and ignore as if they never existed? The truth is that we have lived so long with race, with ethnicity, with differences being the focal point of how we organize ourselves, that we have to recognize that it is very real because the experiences of communities based on that is very real. And so we need to change that. We need to move towards a different place, but we also have to acknowledge the impact that it's had. 
And to, I think, dismiss it or ignore it is very foolish. Um, the, what we see when we go into school communities and, you know, children growing up, they are simply, you know, going to where they feel most comfortable. You go to any campus today, what do you see? School campuses are totally segregated at lunchtime, okay? Not everywhere, but the vast majority of them are. And it's not because they don't all speak English, because they do, but it's because they feel most comfortable in a group. And the truth is, as human beings, that's the way we are. When we move to a new country, we usually go to, we gravitate towards those communities where there are people like us, so we can communicate, so they understand something about our culture and where we came from. There's, it's a very natural thing. But the error we have is when we leave it there, when we don't create that space where everyone comes together, where it's safe to step out of your group and to connect with other groups. You know, there's a whole thing about the melting pot. You know, you'll hear that um, that's what we are. And I think about that, and I think melting pot, melting pot is where you put something in a pot and everything becomes the same. And I don't see that. I don't feel it. I certainly don't experience that when I, you know, get a kosher burrito or, you know, Muslim Chinese food or fusion food, you know. I mean, we do have a diversity of heritage, of, of, of cultures, and thankfully, we're all not the same. And then other people have said, well, we're talking about a salad, really, what we're talking about. We're all, you know, we've got the lettuce, we've got the tomatoes, we've got the onions, you know. We're really all separate, kind of thrown into the same bowl. When I think about that, that's not really right. Because we're more than that. I mean, right now, salsa is the leading, you know, condiment sold, uh, passing, now surpassing ketchup. I mean, what happens is that there is a give and take. The cultures we bring, we've all brought, our, our, our heritage has also influenced the existing culture in the United States. It's more like a stew, I think. That's my theory. It is really a stew. You've got your carrots, your potatoes, your, your onions. They all retain their flavor, but they also add to the flavor of that gravy. And that all kind of comes back and affects what the uh, carrots and the, t and the potatoes taste like. The potato in a stew is obviously much tastier than a potato outside the stew because it picks up the flavor of the, rest of, the, of the rest of the food. And really that's, I think, the vision of our society, what we are, is that we all should, should cherish and respect and, and, and honor our own histories and our own culture. But we also have to recognize that we're also something new. We create something new by our society. And it's a good thing. Because you know what? Studies show that when you bring together diversity, you come out stronger. When you have inbreeding, you come out weaker. And it's true with culture. You get better things when you bring cultures together. You get much greater diversity of ideas and approaches. It's a real danger when a society lives so, in such an insular way that they only believe what they do is the correct way and the only way that it should be done. You know, the, I just have to say a little bit about our commission because our commission actually comes out of a, um, a long history. We've been around for, for um, oh, we've got visual. Okay, so there you've got my opening slide. We're gonna move up a little bit. Okay, so Danny, I think you read through this at the beginning, and so I was talking about number six, advancing understanding, tolerance, and solidarity. But you notice there are also two orange ones there. And I wanted to say that Another lesson is that in order to really uh, effectively advance understanding, tolerance, acceptance, and solidarity is you really have to fo foster a culture of peace through education. And through education, I mean schools. And I talked about schools a little bit. Schools are critical places where we need to incorporate the fundamental skills that we need our, our citizens to have for 21st century. And unfortunately, they fall far short of that. In fact, when we go to campuses that are exploding in racial violence or any kind of violence, they scarcely have an opportunity to even talk about what's going on. Why is this happening? Why are people aligning by, you know, by race? They don't have a, anywhere to go to, to, to even discuss that issue. Um, and we know that schools are the place where we can teach critical skills of character, you know, character education. We, that's where we teach them social and emotional intelligence, which we know is even more important than, than IQ in terms of one's success in the world. And at the same time, what's also going on, and that's number two, is you've got society, uh, campuses that are neighborhoods that are just 